people will stagger. All right, people will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to really keep this in your spirit. And I want you to thank the Lord for this day that you have an opportunity to hear the word. We are not really serious about this as Christians because the word of God is so powerful and effective. But unfortunately, we're not holding on to it because we don't even know it. Hallelujah. But there is coming a time you will really look for it. The Bible says that people will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord. And now we are You know, let me tell you something. Take this into your spirit. Begin to memorize scripture. There are people here, there is no one scripture in their spirit. Hallelujah. Not even Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created that. That one, even that one is not in their spirit. Hallelujah. For nothing at all. Everybody knows Matthew 7, 7. Because everyone wants to ask for something. Hallelujah. So we want to ask, we want to knock and do everything. So we know, you know, but still people don't even have that. Some people don't have that. Even Matthew 7, 7. Hallelujah. If that is the case, how will people want to know the words that really affect their life? I want you to really understand. There is coming a time you will look for it. You may not find it. You will struggle for it. You probably might pay money for it. But you still won't get it. So today, it's free. You don't pay. Yeah, even if you come to church, if you like, you have to buy. If you don't like, nobody profits from it. We tell you that give, because the Bible says give. But whether you give or you don't give, that's your problem. It's between you and God. Amen. I'm going to talk about first fruits today. I will preach on it. My prayer is that it will get into your spirit, you will receive it with joy and begin to practice it and see the hand and the glory of God in your life because it comes with a promise. But it is up to us to give. Every Christian prays that. Look, those who don't pray at all, that they don't pray. But even those people, they pray for two things. They wake up in the morning, Lord, Take care of me today and bless me. That's all their prayer. So the one who doesn't pray at all still asks for God's blessing. Amen. And I know that how many of us pray for good health? Hallelujah. Okay, good. But how many of us first pray for money? Oh, okay. But who will be that? Look, I know people, they will tell you that I don't care even if I say, if I have money, I'll go and treat you. If, <laughs> Hallelujah. People like money. And they ask God for money. Hallelujah. They, they, they don't want to give money, even when God has asked them. Hallelujah. You know, I, there are only a few days in the year how many Sundays do we have in a year? Yeah, but I think I preach about money on only two of them. The rest of the two, we preach on money. Okay, amen. But one, this is one of the days. Every January, I pray about money. Because I want you to start the year well. 
Hallelujah. Let's go to the Bible. And we're going to have a very beautiful moment. Today. Just uh, live in expectation. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. No one may be overpowered who can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. A cord of what? It's not quickly what? It's not quickly broken. It stands. And in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 6, let's go to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus taught us something. And I'm going to really try to let you understand that we are doing something this month and we need to do it well. Hallelujah. We are fasting. But Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6 on three major things. Giving, prayer, fasting. These three go, in, go I mean, like hand in hand. And it's important that as we are doing the two, we need to add the third. Amen. Okay. Now, I didn't say six. I said Matthew chapter 6. I didn't say this. First one. Be careful not to practice your no sorry. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. So when you give, when you do what, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, now we move from giving to prayer. When, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not, and you see, he's talking about when, 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 when. He's not saying if, if, if. He's saying when. So he expects you to do these things. Hallelujah. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Please, don't get these scriptures in the wrong way. Now, he says, go, go back one step. Let me, this is not what I'm, what I'm saying. Do not be like them. No, go one, one step. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Now, because of that, people think that they don't have to pray a lot. They just say one or two things and that's it. But that's not true. Because Jesus himself prayed for hours and he did not say many things. He said only one thing. He kept saying the same thing. Because the Bible makes us understand that when he came back, by, uh, they were sleeping. And it was, he said, you couldn't uh, hang out with me for one hour. Then he went back and he came back and he went the third time. And the Bible says that he was asking the same thing. That God, if it's possible, let his car pass me by. However, not your, my will, but your will be done. Hallelujah. So you can say the same thing for three hours. That's not babbling. Hallelujah. When Jesus talks about this, he's talking about people standing uh, in places. You know, some people pray for the people to know that they are praying for her. They just want to. So every time they want a time that, even when they come to church, they want people to. You can, look, motives are important in, 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 in Christianity. Because if you are praying, why are you praying? If you want people to pray, since you've gotten what you want already. And that is people have seen you and they have clapped for you in their heart. That's 
that's your reward. Your prayer will not be answered. Okay, let's go. Nine. That's where we were. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many, how many of us want God's kingdom to come? And how many of us want his will to be done on earth as it is done in heaven? In heaven, there is no fornication. Oh. So if you want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, then it must see. Hallelujah. There is no stealing. There is no lying. There is, I mean, there is no crying. <laughs> I mean, let, let's, we're going to do a lot of Bible studies this year. We're going to really hang out and look at some of this. Because we've made it look some way, but it's, it's supposed to, I mean, if we understand it, we flow with God. And it's so fun uh, flowing with God. I'm, I just want us to come to that point where we know the scripture such that we just flow with him. And we, I, my prayer is that as you study the scripture, pray that the Holy Ghost will be your teacher. Pray that he will be your teacher. He will teach you things that will blow your mind. And one thing I have seen about God is that when he is teaching you things, he begins to give you scriptures that interconnect. He will give you scriptures that interconnect. Sometimes you have read some scripture that you have forgotten about it, but you read him now, and then he makes reference to something that probably by, I mean, if you were walking on the street and anybody asked you anything about that scripture, you wouldn't even remember. But God will give you reference, and he will take you back there. And you know, so, so sometimes you are reading the Bible, and it looks like you, you just got five verses, and you stop and you're just going back and forth to this and to that and to that. And then in those moments, in those moments, I challenge you to take your notepad and begin to write. Because the God is now beginning to download into you. And one thing I have seen about God is when you begin to write them down, He starts to speak to you. When you listen, when you don't write, when you don't do anything, what happens is that, you know, if I give you my precious thing, I want you to keep it well. But when you get to the gate and you forget about it, then you are not serious. Mm, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll keep it in memory. Sure. What did I pre preach last week? You can tell me. Hallelujah. Yeah, because it's past week, people will remember. But. <laughs> They wouldn't even remember the scripture. They will, I mean, like, what I'm trying to say is that when you write them down and you make references to them and learn it, learn it, and learn it, go back home, sit down, take it, look through it again, or listen to it again, whatever you need to do, the best way to really understand it so well is go home, read what you have written. The way you understood it, Write it in that way. And then when you go home, read it. You realize that you understand it better. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's move. So your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now hold on there and let's move to, um, I, I want us to go forward a little bit because I just want to uh, finish what, uh, sorry. So, um, I don't know the verse. But okay. We are not reading the whole of it because only 24 verses. We're going to really skip Part of it, and then we go on. Amen. All right, okay. So now go to verse 16. When you fast, now we move from prayer to what? Okay. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces 
to show others they are fasting. And now it is also when. How many of us fast? It's important you understand that you have to fast. Because Jesus expects that you will fast. He expects that you will fast. Hallelujah. All right. Okay. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not start off. Now we're going back again. What? Giving again. We're going to talk about money again. Now, why is it that he put prayer and fasting in the middle? He has sandwiched prayer and fasting with giving. Money on both sides. That's interesting. Hallelujah. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin <clears throat> destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where your treasure is, So if I want to know where you really, really are, I, find, I try to figure out where your mindset money is. It tells people who you really are. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, this morning I said I'm going to talk about this. But I'm trying to let you understand that in this sermon, Jesus spoke mainly on he spoke about giving, he spoke about fasting, and he spoke about prayer. And as a church, that's what exactly we are doing now. We are fasting, we are praying. That's why we come here every evening to pray. So we are fasting, we are praying, but also we are doing what? We are giving, and we're going to give our first fruit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to understand certain principles in the Bible. Number one is that everything, hallelujah, I say everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. He created everything and everything is His. I, we, we need to really come to an understanding of that. Colossians 1.16, we, we have to really... If we understand that everything belongs to him, then we know that what we have also belongs to him. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So whatever you hold, and let's go, let, let me show you in, uh, because every, I'm going to talk about money, let me show you something in Haggai 2.6. And then we'll read Psalm 59. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Hallelujah. I will shake all nations and what is desired. Let's read Psalm 50, 90 to 2. Psalm 50, 90. Hallelujah. Yeah. Is it there? All right. Okay, let's go. I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest belongs to who? And the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bed in the mountains. Now, just stop there. How many beds do you know about? Bola bed. And then Santrufia. <laughs> and then an eagle, maybe. And then maybe 
what? <laughs> maybe a dove or maybe. I mean, not too long ago, I went to the farm and we saw it. I took a picture of it. I don't know where, but I, I, I mean, the bed was so nice, so colorful. I was asking myself that, how does this bed keep its feet? But it doesn't go to the bed. It doesn't do makeup. Hallelujah. But the bed looks so nice, so colorful. I mean, I was asking, I was looking, and then he won't go to. I think he realized that we were really enjoying his looks. And then he would go and he would turn and go, I was like, ah, this bed. So for some minutes, I was still standing there just watching this bed. But I don't know the name. But God knew. Hallelujah. He says he knows every bed in the mountains. And the insects. Even the lice in your head. You people don't know that. We when we were kids. <laughs> you know, this is is it still in the world? No, I, I didn't hear. Yes, no, yes, no. Yes? Yes? Huh? In the village. Why? Who sent them to the village? Hallelujah. And <laughs> look, you think it's a bad thing. That time, it got to a point, it was nice. People used to have it and they will intentionally put their head on some woman. It's, look, and the, the interesting thing is that we don't see them again. But all these insects, he knows them. You know, and they were not created in the image of God. If he can, if he knows all these, I want you to know he knows you. God knows you by name. God doesn't call you some hair or something. He calls you by name. When he called Samuel, he called him by his name. When he called Abraham, he called him by name. God calls us by our name. He knows us. In fact, he knows your house number. He doesn't need a GPS. He doesn't need your digital address. He will come there. Hallelujah. So I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of bulls? Sacrifice. Now, watch it. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. And then what happens? And call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. I will do what? And you will do what? No. God is saying that he doesn't go to the market with your money. But he, you know, this is what I love about God. When he's making an argument, he makes it in such a way that you have nothing to say when he finishes. He started by saying that everything belongs to me. I created them, they are mine. Then he tells you that, give to me. And he, after that, he tells you that when you give to me, then you can call on me and I will answer you and then you will honor me. Hallelujah. So look at the way it is. I want you, the reason I'm doing this is for you to understand that if you have something, it is God who gave to you. 
Hallelujah. First Chronicles 29, 40. And, okay. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. He's talking to God. And he says, everything comes from you. And we are giving you only what comes from your hand. Now, if you are giving to God, remember that he gave to you first. So you are only giving what he has given to you back to him. What's your problem? What is your problem? Tell me. What you have? Who gave it to you? And he says, give it back to me. L- look at 1 Corinthians. Sorry. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says that. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? Tell me today. Everything you have. And he said, if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Everything you have, you receive. And God gave it to you. Hallelujah. James 1.17. You know, I am just trying to establish something in your spirit. So that when you are doing it for the Lord, you do it well. Every good and perfect gift is from who? From above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly light. Who does not change like shifting shadows? He's faithful. And he is the giver of what you have. He's the provider. He's the one who gave to you. He's the one who blessed you. He's the one who has brought you thus far. The air you breathe was given to you by God. Hallelujah. The money you have in your pocket. Yes, sometimes we think we work for it. Yes, that's fine. You went to work. But who gave you the strength to work? If he decides to take that strength from you, what are you going to do? How would you work and make that money? Amen. If we understand this, it's not going to be difficult for us to give back to God. It's not going to be difficult. We give to everything. We are ready to give to food. We are ready to do Buy gifts for people. We are, but when it comes to really giving back to God, we have questions. But I want you to understand that if you come to the realization of the fact that everything belongs to Him, He gave you what you have, and He is asking you. Many people say that, yeah, but when I give, I don't know what do I get out of it. Hallelujah. Yeah, when I give, I don't get anything. So, me, I've come to. Yeah, but I was told that, yeah, if I give my first fruit, God will bless me. But I gave my first fruit, I gave my tithe, and still I'm where I am. There are many things that God does for us that we don't really. At least see. And there are many other things that could probably stop you from receiving. How did you do it? We have learned this morning that even if you give and you give in the wrong way, you don't receive. Because he says that your reward is what the people will talk. Your reward will come from the motives that you had. Amen. So we need to come to an understanding that. He's the, he's the owner of all things and he is asking you that give and you have to just obey and give. We are stewards of what we have. And every steward will have to give an account of what we have. We see that in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 14. We see that when the owner or the boss gave the talent to them, he was expecting that when he comes back, they will account for it. So whatever God is giving to you, you are going to account for it. Unless you don't believe that God gave it to you. If God didn't give it to you, I don't know who gave it to you. But then you will account for it 
one way or the other. Hallelujah. So we need to understand that the one who entrusted what we have to us is going to call us to account for what he gave to us. Everything God gives, he expects that we account for it. Amen. So this Matthew chapter five, uh, 25 gives us a good picture of what a steward is supposed to do. When you receive what God has given to you, he expects that you as his child or as a, um, how would you say the custodian of what God has given to you, you will have to account for it one day. Hallelujah. All right. So we all as Christians have been called to give. And one of the things that God calls us to give is the first fruit. So let's go to my scripture for this morning. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of all your Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, God says that do what? So as you give to God, you are honoring him. How can you honor somebody when you are giving to the person and you are insulting and you are whining and you are complaining and you are you, you say all kinds of things before you give. I, is that honor? That's not honor. So you need to understand that as you give, as you are giving to God, you are honoring Him. And He says, honor me. Honor me with your first fruit. The Lord that we serve, the God that we serve, is asking you to honor Him with your first fruit. The first fruit is one of the three festivals God asked his people to celebrate. There are only three that he asked his people to celebrate. One is the um, Passover. The first uh, is the festival of the unleavened bread, which is Passover. The number two one is the festival of harvest, uh, which is the first fruits, or it's all, today it's called Pentecost. And number three is the festival of the Ingarden, which is the top knuckles. Now, listen carefully. The first fruits was really started by God Himself, asking the people to give their first fruit. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus, Exodus chapter 23, and we'll read from 16 to 19. I'm just trying to really help you to understand this. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. Three times a year. And he says, do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing this. The fat of my festival offerings must not be kept until morning. Bring the best. Bring what? Of your first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Hallelujah. Do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. We, we end with an A. Now, he says, bring the best of your first fruit. And we need to understand that he says that we have to bring it to him. We honor him with it. And he says when we do that, he will also fill our vats and our bands. Hallelujah. In this day and age, you don't have a farm, but I have one. But majority of us, our earnings, amen, is from our salary. So, now our jobs becomes our farm. And every year we harvest. Don't you harvest? 
at the end of this month, if there is no harvest, what will you do to your boss? Assemble back. There will be wahala. Those that are paid, like probably maybe some people, I mean, in January, people are paid early, like 20, um, 20, at most by 23rd, people are paid. And when it gets to like, you know, 26th, 27th, and the thing is not coming, then there is trouble. There is trouble. But that's what God is saying that. You don't now have a field. This is your field. This is your farm. You, you harvest at least 12 times in a year. And this is the first time. Let me bless you. Yeah. What is God doing? When God blesses you, what are you doing with it? When you pray, let me ask you, when you go to God and pray that God should bless you, what are you going to do with it? Huh? What will you do with it? Huh? You want God to bless you to be selfish? That's where the problem is. We want God to give to us, but we don't want to give to God. Now, sometimes I don't really understand that. Me, I'm not God. But from his word, he consistently asks us to give. Read your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. He keeps giving, and he keeps asking us to Hallelujah. Look, from what we read in Psalm 50, seriously, he says that if he needs to eat food, he will not ask you. And we've established that what you have was given to you by him. So if the one who gave to you is hungry, can't he feed himself? Why is he asking you? He says, give and it shall be given to you. So God, it's very simple. God is saying that, give to me and I'll give you more. Are we honest with what God has given to us? As stewards, if I give you something, I decide what you have to do with it. If I give you, for example, you're a banker. If I come to the bank and I give you 10,000 Ghana cities, you can't use my money anyhow. If I tell you that, okay, I want uh, 5,000 of my money to be invested in this kind of fund, that's where you have to put it. You can't tell me that, you can only advise me that this fund can be better than this fund, but you can't force me to. The point is that I decide, even if you give me, I mean, like advice, I will have to decide on where I want to put my money. It's my money. It's not your money. Banks are custodians. We keep our monies for us. Amen. If we don't, if nobody brings money to the bank, the bank will close. If God doesn't give you anything, you 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 go bankrupt. And that's where the problem is. Many of us we think that we work for our own money. We think that oh yeah, but it's my own money. It's not your own money. You will account for it one day. God says he gave it to you. Yeah, but what about the unbelievers? I don't care about them. I'm talking about you. If you were an unbeliever, this conversation would be different. We'll be talking about salvation. I'm not going to go to an unbeliever and ask him to come here. Amen. I'm t- that- my conversation with an unbeliever is about salvation. It's not about his money. If he has his money, it's his money. I, where he got it, that's not my business. I'm talking to you as a Christian. God, if, unless you, you are a Christian but you use something else, maybe some other book, I don't know. But if it's the Bible, 
then we need to go into the Bible and begin to see what God has said concerning you and me and how we have to live our lives to honor him. So stop talking about the unbeliever. Stop thinking about them. If you want to think about an unbeliever, think about the fact that you want to reach out that person for Christ. Don't think about their wealth. If you read the Psalms, you'll see. Even the people in the Bible sometimes said that. But we have an example. He said that until I went into the house of the Lord, then I saw their end. Look, if Christians will begin stop looking at the unbelievers and their world and focus on Christ, who is our God. Things will be different. Many of us, we want to have it the way they had it. But it doesn't work. Because you try, probably, to do what they do, and it's not going to work out for you because you are not one of them. If you are a Christian, you begin to follow what Christ teaches. That's what you try to do. That's what you focus on because He owns you and He's giving you His instruction, and you have to follow the instruction that He gives unto you. Amen. So we need to understand that we have to give unto him because he's asking us to do so. And he says that the first fruit is one of the three festivals he wants you to do. Many, in fact, maybe you, you haven't heard about it, but many churches do it and they call it a harvest. And it's indeed the feast of harvest. So you see some churches, they say, oh, this year harvest, we are raising uh, something, something thousand. Some, something, something million, something, something, whatever. But the point I'm trying to make is that that's the thing that, the exact thing we're talking about. But if it is a first fruit, then, because, you know, many of them, and watch it, many of these in Ghana, many of the harvest you see is from July, August, getting to the end of the year. Do you know why? Because when the church started in Ghana, most of the people that they were preaching to came to the house. And that's when the harvest of fishermen. Now, you are two city, city looking people. But if you were like me and you lived in the village, you will know what I'm talking about. If you go to the village, even till today, only probably three weeks ago, I was speaking to my, um, my uh, nephew from my hometown. Just, it's not far away from Accra. Me, my hometown is like one and a half hours from Accra. He just would go here. And he said, yeah, me, this year harvest, you know. That was last year, 2021. End of, they did it at the end of the year. Me. And someone man price <laughs> They did it. The, the person really preserved that plantain, allowed it to go. It was so big. But because there was no money, people couldn't buy it at any high price. You know, they will they will it's it's like uh uh the auction. So they will say, okay, somebody. Okay, two CDs. Then somebody will say 10 CDs. Then somebody will say 50 CDs. Then somebody will say 100 CDs. They'll go out. So if the place is quiet and nobody is saying it, the highest bidder wins. Then they give the plantain to the highest bidder. The best part is the water. Because the sofa has prayed over it and then it's been blessed. Hallelujah. That's what they call harvest. And because that's how the church started. But you today, you don't have a farm. So why should I do it in July? Because when they harvest, you know, around June, July, sorry, July, August, September, October, that's when a lot of the harvesting of our crops are done. If you are a cocoa farmer, you begin harvesting around uh, September and the season opens in October, so you begin to sell. Hallelujah. So your first harvest, that's 
So if you are a Kofko farmer, definitely your first harvest is going to come in uh, October. But if you are not a cocoa farmer, but you are a salaried worker, then your first harvest comes when? January. And that's when you have to give your first fruit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So, many people are saying that, yeah, but why should I bring it to the pastor to spend my money? Let's go to the Bible. Numbers 18. Verse 8. Because of this, I will weep and wail. No, Numbers, not Micah. Yep. Then the Lord said to Aaron, I myself, and he's talking to the priest, I myself have put you in charge of the offerings presented to me. God doesn't come from heaven to take the offering. Hallelujah. That is why sometimes when, when you bring your um, titan and I'm praying, I said I receive it on behalf of you. Amen. And then, so as I stand in his place, I also have the power and the authority that has been given to me by him to then declare his blessing. Amen. So <laughs> I myself have put you in charge of the offerings presented to me. All the holy offerings that Israel give, that Israel give me, I give to you and your sons as your portion, your perpetual. The word perpetual means You understand? It means everlasting. It means forever. So God has given that to the priest forever. Hallelujah. Okay, go on. You are to have the part of the most holy offering that is kept from the fire. From all the gifts they bring me as most holy offerings, whether grain or sin or guilt offerings, that part belongs to you. And your son. Mm -hmm. Eat it as something most holy. Every male shall eat it. You must regard it as holy. This also is yours. What, whatever is set aside from the gift of all the wave offerings of the Israelites. I give this to you and your sons and daughters as your perpetual share. Everyone in your household who is ceremonially clean may eat it. I give you all the finest olive oil and all the finest new wine and, and grain. Sorry. I give you all the finest olive oil and all the finest new wine and grain. They give the Lord as the first fruit of their. All the land's first fruits that they bring to the Lord will be yours. Everyone in your household who is ceremonially clean may eat it. Amen. So if you think the pastor is eating your money or chopping your money, God gave you power. You know, some people are called perpetual. Hallelujah. I know your mind is now going round, round, round. The truth is that it is the right of the minister of God. It is his right according to the word of God. Let me, <laughs> I don't think it's a disclaimer, but let me say it. I mean, I want you to understand that it is, I'm not saying this out of anything, but my prayer is that what this is supposed to be for the pastor. But I will forever give it back to God. That's my prayer. I've never taken it before. Never taken a salary in this church before. Never taken anything in this church before. And I pray that God will give me the grace. Never. Not because it is not my right. But because I pray. And want to be like him. Hallelujah. Paul said it. He said that, look, it is not that I don't have the right. I have the right. But I want to set you an example. I give my first fruit. 
Mine probably is bigger than yours. But I pay my first fruit. I pay my tithe every month because as a minister of the gospel, I still work. So the church, even though the church doesn't pay me, I have a secular job I do. And that pays me. And so, I stand in the pl same place as you. I also take a salary at the end of the month. And therefore, I also have to pay my tithe, pay my offering, pay my first fruit. So, I am setting you an example. And you can ask the account people. I'm setting you an example and I want you to follow it. And I want you to be faithful in your giving. Because the God that we serve, you know, the, I remember my, we, we shared a testimony with somebody, with, with a friend of ours. When we spoke, the first thing the person said was that, why you people, you pray. I said, it's not because we pray alone. We fast as well and we give. You know, what I want you to understand is that when God says something, we need to obey. We have to be responsible Christians who are willing to obey the word of your master. We have to. And if we do it, these are not my words. Go back to uh, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 again, if you can put it. Yeah, that would be great. I want you to understand that these are not my words. They are God's words. And he says that honor the Lord with your wealth. We have already seen that where your treasure is. If you are afraid to give your wealth to God, your heart is not Because that's your treasure. And if you are afraid to give your treasure to the one who created you, in fact, the one who gave it to you, then there's a question mark about your uh, relationship with him. Because if you really belong to him and you believe that he gave it to you, you will be willing to honor him. Hallelujah. So I want you to understand, don't, if you, you know, most of us, we talk too much. Even when we don't know the word, we still talk about things we don't know. We still talk about things we don't know. And I want you to understand that just go into scripture. Pray that God will give you understanding. And you will be able to really do what you have to do and do it right. Amen. Other people say that, yeah, but as for me, my money is too small. If I give, Everything will be gone. Hallelujah. Even let everything be gone. Yes, it may be small. But what does the Bible say? If you are dishonest, then there is a problem. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. I don't want you to be dishonest. Some people, they have, but they tell, you know, you know the interesting thing about Christians? They tell God that they don't have when God knows what they are giving to them. Yeah, but me, I don't have. But they have. In fact, if, listen. Me, I don't keep money. Let me, let me tell you. Who wants to? Okay, John chapter 1. Can you give me your Bible? Then he says, I don't have. I gave you my Bible. And I want this. I don't have. I'm going like, I have witnesses too. <laughs> like, what's wrong with this guy? I gave you my own Bible. What are you holding? Is it not my own Bible? And I say, give me. He said, I don't have Bible. You know, what is, it? what is this? And who gave it to you? Didn't I give? Now I, the giver, want my Bible. I don't have. What does that mean? 
And God is looking at you and saying, where am I now? What's wrong with this one? The, the, the irony of it is that the next minute he goes to the altar. Lord bless me. I need money. I want a Bible. What's wrong with this guy? I just gave you one. When I asked you, you said you don't have. Now you come to me again. Hallelujah. like you. I like your faithfulness and your sincerity. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's how we behave every day. Every single day. We go to God. And look, listen to me. This has happened to me. Somebody came to me. Nice face. Recently he sent us. He's, he's not here right now, but Recently, he sent us a message asking how we are doing and everything. He came to me. We were downstairs in my office. He said, Daddy, you know these days I'm unable to come. But it's my work. I don't have time. So he, 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 he drives. He said, my, ma, Madam, I'm 15 hours. By the time you leave me, church has closed. Even Sunday, he will call me. But I can't come to you. So, what, what, what are you doing for me? So, me, I want a new job. But that is why I've come to you. So that you help me pray. But also give me a job. That I will have more time. I can serve both jobs. Because I want to serve you. I looked at you. And I had Without wisdom. I had compassion without wisdom. I didn't ask the thing to listen. So I was sitting on my seat. He was sitting there. I said, Bow down your head like this. And he went like this. His head went like this. And I began to pray. The moment I began to pray, the Holy Spirit asked me, What are you doing? I'm praying for the guy. He says, he wants to serve you well. Serve you well. That is why. And as you see, the time that I have given to you, what is it? This is a real story. It's not a third party. It's, it, it, it happened to me and him. So I stopped the prayer. And I asked him, Master, because this has your heart, the time he has given to what are you doing? Then he started laughing. <laughs> I said, I was serious, but he was laughing. And I'm like, what? What does this guy take me for? And I said, why are you laughing? He said, yeah, you see, sometimes I close early, but I don't come. <laughs> and I told him, I said, don't joke with God. I told him, I said, don't you ever joke with God? I told him. I said, you see, we go to God, we pray for things. And I'm telling you, most of the time, he's giving that. Just like this one, he told me. So me, I stopped and I asked him. If he had told he himself, he wouldn't have minded. And many of the times, we go to God, we are praying, and God is saying that, what is this guy asking? And you yourself, the prayer you are praying, you know that there's no answer. You know that nothing is going to come out of it. Of going to prayer meetings in Kwesimin Tim Kojokro Keten everywhere. Hallelujah. Stop going doing the, oh, oh sorry, I'm, I thought I'm Takradi. <laughs> uh, where? Sotium uh, where is that? Kaswa. Stop going to prayer. People okay, I won't go there. But but stop that. Begin to check yourself because it's not where you are going, it's the God that you are talking to. That is what is important. It's not where you are going to sit. Yeah, her anointing will have him to be quiet. No, that's not the case. You can sit under the most anointed person. Nothing will happen to you. Because that person is being used by God. It's not him. 
and you are lying to him. He might not know. Just like this guy. I, you see, when he said it, that's why I said, uh, uh, I started to pray. Because I had compassion without wisdom. Because I, I just felt that, no, this is, this is good. I mean, when somebody comes to tell you, you're a pastor, your church member comes to you and says, I want to be more committed. And I need a, a new job so I can come to church more. Ah, what will you do? You pray. And he didn't ask you for money. He asked you for prayer. It's easy. Please. They don't, look, when I pray, it's, it's prayer. I pray to God. He gives it to you. You know. So I will pray. And I started praying. Then the one I'm praying to asked me, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. <laughs> you know, when God asks you, what are you doing? When you are praying, you think, my God, I'm praying. You should know what I'm doing. <laughs> God should know what I'm doing. I'm praying. Wasn't I praying? So you, you, you cried, you were not there, you know, but why didn't God know? And I said, God, I'm praying. The guy said, you want then he said, ask him the time that I have to be free. And he said, he started laughing at me. And I'm looking at the guy. I'm, I, what is this guy? I believe the Holy Spirit was laughing as well. Because I was the only stranger in the room. I was the one who was so ignorant. I didn't know what was going on. The guy knew he was lying. The Holy Spirit knew the guy was lying. And I am sitting there. I thought the guy is so anointed. He wants to serve God. Don't let anything deceive you. Hallelujah. Seek wisdom from him. Let him talk to you. Hallelujah. But. <laughs> Amen. What I want us to really understand. That God who gave it to you knows that he's giving it to you. So if he is asking you. He knows what he's asking. Look, I tell people, when some people say that when you call some people, oh, I didn't have money for offering, that's why I didn't come to church. I said, if it is God who gives money, and he hasn't given to you, and you come to church and you don't give offering, is God blind? Doesn't he know that he has not given you anything? He knows. So me, to tell you, me, I don't mind. When I didn't have anything, I'll go to church. And when I, look, your, uh, the Vodafone, I've given Vodafone before. That time it wasn't Vodafone, it was something else. Maybe there was no mobile phone in the world. I mean, Ghana, sorry. So maybe I gave, I gave but I don't know. Uh, I don't even remember what the denominations were. But I gave. I've given coins before. Everything. I've given everything before. Because me, I didn't have. I'm telling you the truth. I did not have. But what I knew was that everything the Bible says is true. So me, I will go to the house of God empty-handed. If I don't have, I don't have. Then I will go. If I go and I don't have anything, it's not empty-handed because God knows I don't have. Amen. Look, let everybody dance and sing and give offering. Me, I won't do a lewa, but I will dance. Amen. If, let me tell you, if you dance and you come uh, and then do God a lewa, there's nothing in your hand and you you. you for people to know that you also have something, you put your, money, your hand inside. If you are not careful, you steal. Then you do aleva. Then you, you continue dancing. It's not right. Don't deceive you. If you don't have, don't. but come to church. Let not what you don't have. We say first fruit. If you don't have, don't have. I want you to understand that if you don't have, you don't have. And God knows that you don't have. Don't pretend that you have when you don't have. If you don't have and you want prayer, come, let's pray. That God will bless the works of your hands so that you can have. But don't try to deceive God. Don't try to be who you are not. Because the point is that he sees all things. So he sees you. And if you have and you want to tip God to, that's also not good. right. But let's 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 go on and read Luke chapter three. Thank you. Sir. He looked around at them all and then said to the man, 
stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might eat Jesus. Are we reading from the, where I really want to have to read from? Maybe to, sorry about that. Let me quickly. Hallelujah. Are we here? All right, okay. Um, it's 16. I don't know why. All right, okay, so let's go to 16. From verse 10. Yeah. I just missed it. Okay, right. He says that whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Now, who is the one we are talking about? God gave to you. And he was talking about the showing manager, if we remember the, that parable. Now, the truth of the matter is that if we are dishonest, with what God has given to us. And the same God is asking us and we tell him we don't have. That's dishonesty. And Bible says that if you are dishonest, can you go back to dishonesty? If you are dishonest, uh, whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. Now, many of us, oh yeah, but maybe seek as well. And so what? Give according to what you have. Not according to what you have. Amen. Many of us, but if, you see, and this is also true, if you are believing God for something big, you can then tell God, I, seriously, I won't tell you to go and take a loan and give it to me. Me, I won't tell you that. Don't go and take a loan and give to God. If you don't have, you don't have. You can make a vow, but that's not loan. And God will bless you. And when God blesses you, be faithful and give the vow. I'm going to talk about that next week. Hopefully. But what I want you to really understand is that if you look closely at this, he said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest. So if, God, if you think God has given you very little and yet he asks you for it and you just tell God that, what are you talking about? You gave me only small and you said you have to give to me. Who gave you? And he knows that what he has given to you is what? So if you give him little, he understands. Because that's what he's given to you. Hallelujah. But he goes on to say that, verse 11. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you are dishonest with a little, why do you think that you are praying for breakthrough and the breakthrough will come? Who is supposed to give you the breakthrough? Me? Who? And you are lying to him. You are being dishonest with him. And then you still go to the same God. And you ask him, like the guy. You think the time that he's giving to you is little. Fine, I don't have a problem with that. But the little that you have, what are you using it for? You're not using it for God. You're using it to converse with your friends and go to all kinds of places. And then you come to God and you say you want more. And then God says, take. No, God doesn't work like that. So God is saying that 
if you cannot be trusted with little, then don't expect that you'll be trusted with more. Verse 12. And if you have not been trusted with someone else's property, who will give you property? If somebody gives you something and you misuse it, how do you expect that God will give you? Look, I don't have time for stories this morning. I would have told you a lot of them that God has dealt with me in my life. A lot of things that God has really brought me understanding. So now, when I do things with God, look, one thing I will leave with you this morning, do not ever think that God has not seen. He knows everything you are doing. He has eyes. If you ever have eyes and you can see, and he gave you those eyes, he has eyes. He's the only God who can see plenty eyes. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes you see, you look at certain things and you marvel. You look at um, insects and you look at the kind of eyes they have. And you say, how can they see with this? Like the crab. It's remote control. He has to bring it them out like you know there was a car like that, the headlights, you have to when you press the when you switch on the light, then they come out. But when it's driving in the daytime, you don't see that they have light. It is only when in the night, when they switch on the light, then they come out. It's like the crab. Hallelujah. And I asked myself, I mean, how did God do this? I suppose they say, Shh. Amen. But He's God. And if He can make your eyes and my eyes, and can make an eye for the snake, and make one for the. I mean, let's, let's, let's just think about this. How does he do this? Isn't it amazing? And you know they see better than we do. Because they see us, we don't see them. The ant is small, walking around there, and then you won't see. Amen. There are some bacteria in your body, they have to use microscope and telescope and every cope that you can think of to find them. But they find you and come and live in you. Mm. I said they find you and they come and live in you. But you can't find them. When a doctor wants to see them, he has to go and take when you go to the lab. They use one eye. And then they try to figure out what is it. That thing there, he has seen them already. If, you know, I'm just trying to let you understand the God that you are serving. You see, you see he's so, I mean, he, he goes beyond everything. Because how does he create all these things? All these little, little things. And they are around us. And if he is God, and he is doing all these things, Please, when you are dealing with him, be careful. Be careful. Because he sees things you don't see. He knows your thoughts. He says before you even plan to pray, he knew what you were going to say. He knew it. So before you open your mouth, he said, no. Before your mother conceived, he knew that you. you. Hallelujah. You know, that's how God is. So if even when you were clot of blood in your mother's womb, he knew you. I want you to really understand that now that you are old and you are grown like you are sitting here, he knows you. If he can go into your mother's womb and know you, even when you don't have leg and eyes and anything, then how about now that you are standing like this? I just want you to really understand that God knows you. God sees you. You can't lie to him. So if you have it, and he is asking you, 
you don't have to lie to him, but be faithful and do what he says. Hallelujah. And he says that very He says that very He says, I will fill your uh, bank for you if you are faithful to me in this, if you will give to me. If you will come to me and will not complain, will not think about how... You know, some people give to God like it's lottery. This is not lottery. This is not like I will win or I will win. This is the word of God. And he says that my word will not come back to me void. So if we faithfully do what we have to do, God will honor him. The last question that people ask, is, yeah, but if I give all, it will affect you. So they tip God. You know, when you go and eat, or when you take Uber and you want to tip, if it is 10 cities that you pay, you give him one city. Tips are always less. Hallelujah. So some of us, we tip God. We go and give. We know we can give him 10 cities. We know we can give him 100 cities. We know we can give him 200 cities. But we go and tip God with two cities. Waste of time indeed. You're wasting your own time and you're wasting God's time. Hallelujah. But David says something, and I'm going to end with that. Let's go to 2 Samuel. And we all know uh, the story when uh, David had done the census and God was really angry and he was killing them and all that. And David. Um, God had stopped it, and David was to give an offering to God. 24 24. So he went, I mean, the uh, Bible says that the angel of the Lord was standing on Aruna's, uh, uh, Aruna's field. So David was to make a sacrifice there for him. Then David went and he said, but the king replied, and he wanted to buy the land and everything. But then Aruna said, no, 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 no. If we can, can you put it back there so that I can read it for people to really understand what happened? Because that will give you a deeper understanding of what we are doing. And I'm just ending right now. And then I'll give you time to think and prepare your heart to give to God. Okay. When Aruna looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Aruna said, Why has my lord, the king, come to his servant to buy your threshing floor? David answered, So I can build an altar to the lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Listen carefully. This was not for his personal gain. It was for his people. So that the, but seriously, he created it because he went to sin. Anyway, so Arida said to David, Let my Lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and here are treasure sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Hallelujah. Your Majesty, Arida gives all this to the king. He's giving him the land, he's giving him. Uh, what he needs for firewood and everything. <clears throat> Aruna also said to him, may the Lord your God accept you. Not only was he giving him everything, but he was praying for the king that his offering, his sacrifice will be acceptable. My prayer is that what are you going to give to God as your first food will be acceptable because there is, a, there is also the I mean, likelihood that it will not be accepted. So my prayer is that your offering your tithes and the first fruit that you are giving to God this year will be acceptable before God. Hallelujah. But the king replied to Aruna, No! I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God, the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Is the Bible that you are holding your own? Underline it. Let that word in the 
Bible guide you in giving to God. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. There are times that the offering you are giving, the tithe you are giving, that is why many people, they don't give their tithe. They say, hey, this man, me watch him. Ah, this man was not good. Even in that, let it be. Give it and eat diary for the man. But in reality, the tithe is only one tenth. So if without that one tenth, your life is still not going to be all great, then there is a question mark. If you can't pay your tithe, first free to be. Because mostly in prison. Because you see, God is saying that give me your first harvest. And the farmer is ready and willing to do that. Because he sees the cross and he sees that there's going to be another harvest. But we are unwilling to give our all. So most of the time, we want to give that, we want to do this, we want to do that, we want to do that. I pray that the Spirit of God, I said, I pray that the Spirit of God will lead you and guide you. I'm not going to say anything. I'm saying that let this first fruit that you are giving let it be something that you will feel it. But don't give gradually. Don't give gradually to the Lord. Don't give complaining. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. How can I be cheerful when it's costing me? When you know that you are giving to God, even though physically it's costing you, you know that what you have came from him. And you know that you can trust him. Beloved in the Lord. This morning, I encourage you. To stick to the word of the Lord. Be a giver. Anytime I talk about giving to the Lord, I always love to read Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Anytime. And he says, give, and it will be given to you. Now, a good measure, press down, shaking together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured again. The measure We cannot give the same. I may give more than you. Someone else may give more than me. And someone else may give more than that person as well. But God says that with a measure to use. 
I want you to understand. If you give little, and that's what you have, God knows what you have, and you will bless you. If you have, and you give little, and you give in such a way that it dishonors God, you are not good. I don't know what you want to do. I don't know how much you are going to give. I will never know it. But God will see it. God will know it. So I want each and every one here this morning to bow down their head and pray. I have taken my time and you have realized that I've been very slow in presenting this and preaching this sermon because I want you to understand it and I want you to. Most of us are so unfaithful with our finances when it comes to giving to God. We can use our money to do a lot of other things except when it comes to giving to God. And we forget that God gave it to us. I want you to be very, very, very obedient to the Lord in what he's telling you. We are in the middle of the month. You have time to make this decision. Before you receive your salary at the end of the month. And I want you that as you pray right now, may you speak your heart. Just pour it out unto the Lord. You may, you may, you may not have. But you look into your heart and you say, Lord, I want to give. So give me so I can give. You can call an amount to God. This is a prayer between you and God. Tell him, Lord, I want to really give you so much. But Lord, you know I don't have. Grant me that grace. Bless me so I can be a blessing to your church. Talk to him. Let him know that you are willing Let him know that you want to give your best. Tell him that, Lord, of what you have given to me, I give my best to you. Don't be afraid. Just open your heart to him. Remember that he is your source. He is the giver. He is your provider. And he is the one who will give you to give. So open up your heart and talk to him.
Tell him that, Lord, I'm giving my best this year. I am willing to bring to you my best. Maybe in the past you have given him tips. But today, this time round, you really want to be faithful and you really want to be honest with God. You want to be honest with him. So you want to really give to him what you know that God will be pleased with. So talk to him and ask him. You are my provider. You are my source. You are the one who blesses me financially. Yes, I have a job. But it is you who give me the grace and the strength even to do that job. So I know. Because if I don't go to work, they will not pay me. But if you don't give me the strength to go, then I will not go, then I will not be paid. So the job is not my source. But the one who gives me the strength to do that job is my source. He's the one who gives you the wisdom. He's the one who gives you the ability. So he is your source. He is your source. You can be kicked out of one company, but God will give you another one. One door must be maybe closed, but another will be open. Because God is your provider. He is your source. And he will provide for you. So be willing to give to him. Be ready that Lord I want to give to you. Father we thank you this morning. I give you praise, glory and honor in the name of Jesus for your word. I pray that each and every one, Father, will be faithful this morning and will take to heart this word that has come and will give generously unto you. As we prepare our minds and we prepare our hearts and we prepare to give unto you our first fruits by the end of the month, we ask you in Jesus' name that you will touch everyone and you will give unto us. I pray in the name of Jesus. That each and every one will give unto you what you have given. May it not come because we have stolen. But may we give to you what you have legally blessed us. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, may our first fruits be acceptable unto you. I pray, Father, for anyone who is making a vow in his heart. The Lord, I don't have this. But I desire that you, if you bless me, I'm going to really give this unto you. Father, may they be faithful. And may you bless them with what they are asking for. I pray in the name of Jesus. If anyone has made a vow this morning in their heart, it's between them and you. I don't know. Nobody knows. But if they have faithfully made a vow in their hearts, I pray in the name of Jesus you will help them. To pay that vow. You will help them. To be faithful. You will help them. To honor their vow. I thank you and I bless you Lord. I glorify you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the grace. That you have given unto us this month. To give. To fast and to pray. Lord in the name of Jesus. We know you have given us the strength to fast. And you have brought us this far. These seven days past. You have given us strength. This is our eighth day. And we are so grateful unto you. For the strength that you have given unto us. You have shown us your faithfulness Lord. That you are the one who gives strength unto his children. And you have given us the strength to fast. We are also trusting you in the name of Jesus. That as we give unto you the resources. Our money. You will also, Father, give back unto us according to your word. May every prayer that we have offered, may every prayer that we are yet to offer, for before we open our mouth, you know it already. 
I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that whatever your children are asking for, whatever during this fast they are praying for, and mostly we are praying that you will help us to grow. I pray in the name of Jesus that we will grow, that we will mature in the spirit, and we will grow in our finances, and we will grow in our faith, and we will stand strong and firm and walk in your will. Father, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we bless you. We glorify you for what you are doing. Bless your this house. Bless this house. For this is your house. Bless everyone sitting here this morning. Let your peace rest upon everyone as they cry unto you, as they openly come before you and are willing Give. give them the grace and the strength to give generously to the cause of your glory. To give generously to the Son and to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.